Go oh, give him that. I got it. Thanks, sir. Good. And the, the table's a sterling thing. I like to use the regular old podium, so. Well, good morning, uh, Mill Creek. We're, it's great to be with you guys. I'm glad that uh, you're all here. Um, hustling over from Kesslinger, watching the thunder, and hoping I make it here on time. Walking in here in Eric singing, gives me a sense of peace and calm, like everything's under control. We're in a series, if you've not been with us or if you're new, maybe, perhaps, and by the way, if you've missed some of the sermons, you can catch up on all of them on our Chapel Street Church app, called The Disciplines of Grace where we're looking at biblical practices for Christians throughout history of how do you walk in, experience, and grow in the grace of Jesus? What are the things you're supposed to do and put in place and practice in your life? Uh, I've been encouraged and grown through it in my own study and, and preaching of these things, and I hope you have in your, uh, as you track along with us. The discipline this morning is like, it, it's really at the center in the heart of our faith. It's the essence of what it means to be a Christian. It's the discipline of forgiveness. We, we say in the creed, maybe you grew up in a, recite the Apostles' Creed, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. What does that mean to believe in the forgiveness of sins? Or right in the Lord's Prayer, right? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It's, this, it's right in the essence of what we say we believe. And there's no question that we are called to forgive as Christ followers. There's no getting around it. It's not optional. In fact, I've said this before, but there's three litmus tests for how you know you're growing in the grace of Jesus your ability to serve other people, your ability to be generous with what God's blessed, how God's blessed you, and your ability to forgive those who wrong you. You could do, that, that, if you want to test for how do I know that I belong to Jesus and I'm growing in grace, if you can forgive, if you can serve, and if you're generous, that means I think you, those are good indications that he has a hold of your heart. It's a beautiful ideal. In fact, the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, compassionate, forgiving each other as God in Christ forgave you. And in Colossians chapter 3, verse 13, bear with each other, forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Ephesians 4.32 sounds nice, doesn't it? It sounds like the kind of thing that you might stencil on a piece of reclaimed barn wood and uh, put on Pinterest or hang over your mantle, or put in your home, right? You know, forgive, be kind and compassionate, tenderhearted, forgive each other. Yes, that's good, that's nice, we believe in that. C.S. Lewis said, everybody thinks forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something very hard to forgive. Or put another way, I really believe in forgiveness when I need it. I'm a little less likely to believe in it when you ask for it and I'm hurt. When you put a specific name to it, or a specific hurt or wound to it. It changes it, doesn't it? Forgive that, forgive them. I mean, forgiveness in general, yes, but this is different, our heart tells us. Years ago, when I was the high school pastor, um, you know, now Gretchen and Tom lead the high school ministry far better than Sterling, who replaced me or I ever could. But back in those days when we were uh, poorly led and uh, disorganized when I was in charge, and I, we would take missions trips to the south side of Chicago and uh, in the Roseland community, rough area. We worked alongside men that were in recovery in this program, and part of their job was they lived in these homes, abandoned homes, that the, the center of ministry was reclaiming and rehabbing to give to families that were under-resourced. And these men would live in those homes for free in exchange for the work that they would do. And we worked alongside a guy named Otis. Our kids loved Otis, students loved Otis. He told great stories about life in the hood. He loved Jesus, he quoted scripture, he was just a cool guy. And we worked with him for two years on this home going back the third year, ready to see this home, like ready to be given to a family, and Otis wasn't around, and that house was like, we didn't see it. I asked Reverend Tony, who led the center at the time, what happened to Otis? He said, oh, Brother Jeff, Otis had a relapse. He stripped everything of value out of that house, sold it for drug money, and we haven't seen him. I was so mad. I'm like, our church gave money to that. We worked on that for two years. I was really upset. And <laughs> Reverend Tony seemed to like, keep like, ah, oh, you know, things happen. I was kind of stunned. I said, how do you let that roll off your back? How do you? He said, I learned a long time ago, if you're going to love broken people, you're going to get hurt. It's just going to happen, brother, he said. No, it was his ministry, loving broken people. Loving your neighbor is risky business. 
because people will hurt you. Bad news, friends. People will hurt you. <laughs> Pastor Roger, who passed away a number of years ago, and we loved him dearly, he used to say, people should be better than they are, but they're not. <laughs> So the bad news is people are going to hurt you. The good news is God invented this thing called forgiveness. But there's a lot of misunderstanding and baggage about what forgiveness is and what it isn't. And so before we jump into Jesus' teaching on what forgiveness is, I want to take a few moments because I think it's really important to, to understand what forgiveness is not. In my work as a pastor, I see a lot of people get twisted up spiritually because they think forgiveness means something it does not mean. So let's go through a little list here. First, Forgiveness is not ignoring the offense. It does not mean pretending nothing ha like nothing happened. It does not mean like acting like they didn't hurt you when they hurt you. It doesn't mean ignoring the offense. Now, no question, we live in a culture of the easily offended today, don't we? I mean, everyone's offended all the time about everything. It's hard to know from week to week what's going to offend somebody and what's not. As Christians, we should not be easily offended people. We should give those who believe differently and wrong us the benefit of the doubt. We should believe the best about them. We shouldn't be keeping short lists or long lists of those who have said things that irritate us or wrong us. We shouldn't be easily offended. But that does not mean there aren't real offenses in the world. There aren't real hurts in the world. And forgiveness, biblical forgiveness, does not mean pretending like it didn't hurt. You know, I, I grew up playing sports. I wrestled and played football in high school and in college, and so I was sort of conditioned by coaches that you don't show your weakness. You don't let your opponent know when you're hurting or suffering or tired or whatever. And I sort of un unintentionally have absorbed that kind of mentality over the years into my spiritual life, and it's not good, and it's nowhere in the Bible. You know, you wouldn't do that with like a compound fracture, bone sticking out of your shin. doesn't hurt. I'm fine. You know, like... So forgiveness does not mean pretending like it, it didn't hurt or there's no offense. It's number two, forgiveness does not mean condoning or excusing. It doesn't mean pretending it didn't happen. Neither does it mean you're saying what, the, what happened is okay. To forgive someone does not mean you're saying what you did is okay. It's not okay. That's why there's forgiveness. Proverbs 10, 12 tells us that love covers a multitude of sins. We talked about that last week with, with confession. It does not say love condones or excuses a multitude of sins. It's a mistake to think that to forgive means you're saying this is okay. And I think some people in our culture, outside of God's grace, watch Christians who forgive horrible things, and they, th they make the mistake, don't they? They think, well, you can't forgive that. You're letting him get away with it. That means it's okay. It's not saying it's okay. It's a different thing. Number three, and this is a really important one in our cultural moment today, at all times. Forgiveness does not mean allowing further abuse. And I think people grew up thinking this. Turn the other cheek mentality, Right? Turn the other cheek, then the other cheek. How many cheeks do I have? Well, at least four. I don't know. How many do I turn? I just keep turning the cheek, right? And just keep getting, you know, just take it and take it and take it for Jesus. That's not biblical forgiveness. That's not what it means. Jesus is not calling you to stay in a position where you're vulnerable and couldn't be hurt or those that you love. He's absolutely calling you to forgive, but sometimes the first step is to put yourself in safety. This is a big room. Here at Kesslinger, South Street, across our campuses, statistics tell us there is absolute certainty that some of our people are in abusive relationships. Maybe some of you. Maybe it's verbal abuse or emotional abuse. Maybe it's physical or even sexual abuse. I don't, I, I don't want to miss this. Jesus is, n is calling you to forgive, and we'll get to that, but he's not calling you to stay in a relationship that's damaging to your body or your soul. And, and maybe you know somebody who's in a situation like that, or maybe you are, and you don't know what to do. Okay, who do I talk to? Any of us on staff, but I want to give you two names that are safe people that you could email today, if that's you or that's somebody you know. First is John Hookinga. John is the director of Chapel Street Groups, uh, support and recovery groups. He, he would be a great resource. The second is Kim Erickson. Kim's a member of our executive council and, and uh, what, executive director of operations for Naomi's house. Of course, any of us would respond to you, but those are two safe people that you could reach out to if that's you or somebody you know. Because forgiveness does not mean allowing further abuse. Okay, number four. Does not mean reconciliation or restoration. This is another way that Christians get this wrong. We think to forgive means we're gonna be best friends again. We're gonna go back to the way it was. Um, not necessarily. Forgiveness is a one-way street. Reconciliation is a two-way street. 
I, I see my friend and brother Keenan. Can I, can, can I borrow you for a minute? Can you come up here? He, doesn't, he has no idea I just going to do this. <laughs> Keenan, come here. Now, Keenan could hurt me, but please don't. So, <laughs> so let's pretend that Keenan has deeply wronged me. He hasn't. We're fine. But let's pretend that he has. And let's pretend this Bible represents the hurt that he did to me. Right? So hold this. Don't let go until I tell you. Just hold on to it. Yeah, don't let go until I tell you. Forg- I, for- we think forgiveness works like this. I'll forgive you when I think you've suffered, Keenan. when I think you've hurt like I hurt, when I think you really mean it, when I think you, you know, enough time's gone by. And we play this emotional tug of war, which he would probably win, but, right, but, but neither of us are free. I'm not forgiving, he's not forgiven because I'm not releasing it, right? Can you let go? Stay right here, stay right here. Forgiveness is this. Forgiveness is, Keenan. I'm not carrying that anymore, brother. I forgive you. I release you. Now, Keenan might go, forget you, Pastor Jeff. I don't need your forgiveness. I didn't do anything wrong. We're, we're, we're okay. We're okay. You can, you can sit down. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Right? But un- reconciliation is Keenan saying, I get it. I'm sorry. I picked that up and I receive it. Then we can be restored, right? And again, there's, there's no issue. Right? <laughs> do you see the difference? I've used this analogy before, but it's, I hope it helps you. Forgiveness is saying, I am laying that down. I'm not carrying that wound anymore. Jesus offers you forgiveness freely. Not all are reconciled to him because not all receive in repentance and faith. So you can, you, can, you can always forgive. Forgiveness is always possible. Reconciliation sometimes is not possible because you don't control somebody else's heart. You can't make them respond the way you want them to. You can't do that. But you can forgive. You can release. And fifth, Forgiveness is, is not removing all consequences. Sometimes there are earthly consequences, legal or otherwise, that aren't removed. Yes, of course, to forgive means to bear someone else's burdens and it means to absorb the cost yourself. We'll talk about that. But sometimes there are consequences that you cannot nor should not remove from someone's sin or wrong. Okay, so if forgiveness does not mean all of that, what does it mean? What actually is it? How should it work in a Christian's life? One of the best and I think the most brilliant places where Jesus gives us a picture of forgiveness is a parable he told, the story of the unforgiving servant. You know, sometimes the best things of Jesus are not like lists to follow, which I just gave you a list, right? But they're stories that illustrate to us what this really looks like, the heart of the matter. And so we're going to look at this parable in Matthew chapter 18 of the unforgiving servant. And I can't read anymore unless I wear these, so... Verse 21 through 35. Matthew 18, verses 21 to 35. And by the way, this is right after Jesus teaches about how to confront somebody who's wronged you. How to, how to confront a brother or sister who sins against you. And then right after Jesus does that, Peter asks this question. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all they had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged. I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me. I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. You shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Whoa. That ought to make you squirm a little bit. Did you catch the context for the story, right? Peter's question, did you hear it? How many times? Okay, Jesus, forgiveness is great and all, and I, I, I think we should forgive, but like, where's the line? How far does it go? And, and you may be wondering, why does, he, why does Peter say up to seven times? Well, there's a couple of Old Testament references in the prophet Amos and other places where God forgives pagan wicked nations three times, but then the fourth time doesn't forgive them. And the rabbis in Jesus' day had taken those stories and sort of codified them into a, a number for forgiveness. Like you forgive somebody three times, but the fourth you don't forget. So maybe Peter is like going, I'm more than doubling what the law requires, right? 
I'm, going, I'm being twice as forgiving as the rabbis say. Up to seven times? Look how gracious and forgiving I am. And what does Jesus say? No, no, no. Not seven, but 77 times. Now, your Bible might say 70 times seven or 77s. It's translated both ways. So it's not crystal clear if Jesus is saying 77 times or 490 times. But his point is the same. You're asking the wrong question, Peter. You're putting a limit on God's grace, and there is no limit. There is no line at which we say, so you're not going to go 75, 76, 77, you're dead to me, right? It's not how it works, right? Or 468, 488, 490. You're not counting so I can, no. His point is it's far, far beyond what you're talking about, God's grace and our, our, what we've been forgiven and our call to forgive. Now, in this parable, Jesus told about a king who forgives his servant a huge debt. We'll talk about that in a minute. And the servant, instead of becoming like the king who he served, becomes unlike him and is ungracious and unforgiving. And he's thrown into prison to be tortured, which is, uh. And then Jesus says something to drive home the point. This is how God's going to treat you unless you forgive. That ought to make you squirm a little bit. Now, some of you, if you've been around here for a while, you've heard us talk about grace. We're saved and forgiven by the grace of God alone, not by earning it, not by being morally righteous, not by what we do, by grace through faith alone. And so maybe you're thinking to yourself rightfully, wait a second, time out, Pastor Jeff. I thought we're saved by grace. Why is Jesus here saying that if we don't forgive, we're going to be in internal torment and punishment? Let me be clear. Jesus is not saying if you don't forgive somebody, you're going to hell. It's not what he's saying. Here's what he's getting at. He's saying, if you cannot forgive someone, if you cannot extend grace to someone who needs it, that's a good sign that your heart's never really been open to the grace that I am extending you. Let me give you another example. How many of you have gone apple picking in your life? We live in Illinois, right? In a couple months, it'll be, well, who knows? It'll probably be 100 degrees or freezing. You never know. But in Illinois, you know, fall, I love the fall. It's football season, and the leaves are changing. And you go apple picking in, in mid-October, right? You go up to northern Illinois or Wisconsin, pick one of those apple farms, and you walk through the orchards with our kids, and they're little, and we look for the tree with the big, red, juicy, delicious apples, and I want to eat them right away. My wife, we have to wash them. I'm like, oh, it's, it's natural. It's fine, whatever. So right, we would go, and we'd eat the apples, right? So imagine you go do that with your kids or your grandkids, and you see two trees in the orchard row. One is just full of green leaves and massive red delicious apples. It's like the best apple tree you've ever seen. Like, this is amazing. And right next to it is this tree that's nothing but brown, dry sticks and, and crumbling leaves. Does the presence of the red apples give that tree life? No. If you're not a horticulturist, the answer is no. Right? <laughs> it, it's evidence that there is life in the tree. It's how you know, oh, there's life and health and vitality in that root system because look what's there. Does the, does the absence of apples make the tree dead? No, it's evidence that it is dead. That's kind of what Jesus is saying here. If you cannot forgive, if you just can't extend grace, that's a sign of spiritual deadness in your heart. That's evidence that something's missing in your relationship with Jesus. And this bit about the torment in prison, which is a little bit creepy, I think what Jesus is saying is metaphorically, he's saying if you can't forgive somebody, you're creating your own torture chamber. If you withhold forgiveness and grow in bitterness and resentment over time, you become, it's, it's a kind of prison of its own. You're on the path of becoming less and less like your gracious and forgiving King Jesus and more and more enslaved to your own resentment and unforgiveness. Okay, let's, let's talk about what forgiveness really is. I'm going to read verse 27 again for you here. I'm borrowing from Pastor Timothy Keller, who, who's written about this in, in his commentaries in, on this text. He says, in verse 27, so verse 26, the servant falls on his knees, be patient, I'll pay it back, and the master does three things. Verse 27, took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. Right there in that verse, I think we see the three, you might call them the mechanisms of forgiveness in, in the, for the Christian took pity, canceled the debt, let him go. First, the first step in forgiveness is to take pity. 
Some translations say have compassion. It's the Greek word splanknitsomai. It's fun to say. And it literally means to feel something in your gut. Actually, it means in your bowels. But nobody translates that as bowels because in English that's weird. I love you with all my bowels. Nobody says that, right? right? But it means to feel something at the deep internal gut level. Not hatred, compassion. The same word used of Jesus in Matthew chapter 9 when he looks at the crowds and he has compassion, splanknitsomai, for them because they are harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Deep Level compassion for someone. Lewis Smees wrote a book called The Art of Forgiveness. It's a beautiful book. It's an old book, but I would, I would commend it to you if you struggle with this in, this in your life. And in this book, he has a whole chapter on this parable. And he says, to, to take pity or feel compassion is to rediscover the person's humanity. To see them again as somebody that God loves and cares about and that are in need of his grace. Because what happens when you don't forgive is you create a caricature. How many of you have been to a caricature artist, right? Six Flags or Disney World, right? They sit out there and what do they do when they draw you? They exaggerate some feature. Like my giant head, right? It's smaller than it used to be, but it's still big. And they draw it, right? They make it look ridiculous. And, and you, they, you, oh, it kind of looks like you. Why? Because they exaggerated some feature. Spiritually speaking, we do that when we don't forgive. We create a caricature in our mind of, what, of that person defined solely by what they did to us. And when we look at them or think of them, that's all we see. So if someone lies to you, you don't think, well, there's reasons I, they probably had, I, they didn't mean to. I mean, I could forgive them. I mean, I know sometimes I tell things that aren't true. No, you, you're a liar. You didn't just tell a lie, you become a liar. But you don't do that to yourself, do you? How many of you ever told a lie? <laughs> You're lying now if your hands light up, right? Or not listening, right? <laughs> right? And so what, 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 what do we do when we do that? Well, I, I, sure, it wasn't true, but I didn't want to hurt her feelings. And I, there are extenuating circumstances. I might have spun things a little bit, right? We give ourselves a pass. We're three-dimensional people. We're nuanced. There's reasons. But if someone lies to us, they're a liar. That's all we see. Or they cheat it. They're a cheater. The point is, when you... The first step in forgiveness is to, by God's grace, begin to see them as more than what they did to you. Somebody God loves. Somebody that he cares about. Somebody in need of his grace, just like you are. That's not easy. But that's what it means. It says he, he took compassion on him. The, the king looked at the servant. He doesn't just see a guy who squandered all this money. He sees somebody who's in need of grace. Taking pity means to revive feelings of compassion for the one who wronged you and to genuinely desire God's best for them. That's hard, isn't it? To desire God's best for somebody who hurt you? To pray for that? Do you pray for those who wrong you? And I don't just mean, Lord, smite them. I don't mean that kind of prayer. I mean, do you pray for them? Okay, the second step in forgiveness is to cancel the debt. This is the heart of the matter. This is the whole ballgame. Canceling the debt. Okay, so I don't see them as what they did anymore. They're no longer just a liar, but they still hurt me. There's still a debt outstanding. There's still pain. There's still a wrong done. What do I do with that? What does it mean to cancel it? Well, in the parable Jesus told, the servant owes 10,000 talents. Now, maybe you've studied this. Maybe you're new to the world of the New Testament. Let's talk about how much that is. A talent was the largest unit of, of currency in the Roman Empire in Jesus' day. It's actually a measurement of weight. So it's hard to calculate exactly how much this is because we're not told if it's a talent of gold or of silver or of some combination. But all scholars agree this is a crazy sum of money. It's almost incalculable. One talent was 10 years' wages on average to a skilled laborer in Jesus' day. 10 years, take your salary, multiply it by 10, that's one talent. This guy owes 10,000 times that. It's huge, which tells you this is not a butler or a house servant. This is a lower king, an underlord, who has by mismanagement or corruption put the kingdom in jeopardy. This is in the billions by today's currency. Huge amount of money. Where does the debt go? Where does it go? Do you ever look at your 401k, your investments, and they come through, and it's like, oh, I lost $6,000 last month. How did that happen? I don't know. It just, it's just a, like a weird computer magic. It just shows up. Less, more, less, more. I don't know how it works. The economists could tell me, right? Where does it go? There's a real loss here. The king absorbs it. The king takes it. It means he absorbs the loss. Somebody always pays, even if we're not talking about financial somebody pays. There's only two options. Either you pay it or you try to make them pay it. Even emotionally we do this, don't we? 
Even if you're too good a Christian to say anything out loud, do you ever find yourself being secretly happy when you hear about somebody's misfortune who hurt you? Like, I would never say it, but I'm kind of glad they're not having a great life. They deserve that. What's happening to your soul? Someone's paying the debt down. Either you're doing it every time you try to make them pay or make them suffer or harbor resentment, or you, you, know, you absorb that cost yourself. You give it to God. The, the debt doesn't go away. Think about our debt. Jesus' point here is this sum of money is beyond, how crazy in verse 26. Give me time, I'll pay it back, I promise. Not in a million lifetimes could you earn that much money and pay that debt back. You cannot pay it, which is his point. You and I have been forgiven a debt that is infinite, that you could never pay. Where did it go? Christ absorbed it at the cross. He absorbed the cost. He paid the debt in his body through his blood. He canceled your debt, but it was paid. Somebody always pays. Canceling the debt means absorbing the cost yourself. You no longer try to make them pay, even emotionally. This is the gospel, and this is what makes the third step possible. Let them go. You release your claim over that person. You let go of your right to get even. The Bible tells us, and this is hard to, for us to get, that you actually are required, I'm required to forgive somebody, practice forgiveness before I feel forgiving. We think it works the other way around, don't we? We think it works like this. Well, I'm not ready yet. I can't forgive yet. I don't, I'm not there yet emotionally. I've got, I, 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 got, I need some time. The Bible says, actually, you forgive, and you forgive, and you forgive, and you forgive, and then when you're done with that, what do you do? You forgive, and eventually your heart begins to catch up to your life, to your practice. You don't wait around until you feel like it. Only God can forgive us once for all, separate our sins as far as the east is from the west. For us, it's, it's a process. C.S. Lewis, in a book he wrote, well, he didn't write a book, he wrote a number of letters uh, uh, to a man named Arthur Greaves, his childhood friend. The book is a collection of those letters back and forth called They Stand Together. And Lewis relates a very interesting I incident in his life. He grew up going to boarding school like all kids in his day in, in, in the UK. And the boarding school was Winyard School, and he was abused horribly by the headmaster, who was later certified insane. But when Lewis was there, the guy was horribly cruel to him. Lewis doesn't articulate whether that was sexual or, or physical or verbal or all of it. But it was significant in his life. He's telling, writing to Arthur Greaves, 40 years after that time, he's an, old, he's, he's an Oxford professor. He said, I was walking through, the, through Oxford campus, and something suddenly reminded me of those days. In an instant, I was brought back to those days of abuse as a, as a young boy. So I began to tremble with rage, and I had to sit down. And I found to my dismay, he says, that I had to forgive the whole thing all over again. Can you relate to that? Like, I thought I was done with that. I do this again? And Lewis says, God is teaching me that the way you know you're making progress in forgiveness is that the length of time between those remembrances gets greater and greater, and the intensity of those remembrances gets less and less. So it's not every day, every week, it's years go by, and it's not quite as enraging as it was. And slowly God is healing your heart, making you like him, the forgiving king. Lewis says, to forgive once is no trick. It's to forgive every time the offense is remembered. That's the real challenge, and it cannot be done outside of God's grace. Again, in an, essay, in an essay on forgiveness, Lewis writes, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable in others because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. This is so radically unlike our world, isn't it? When's the last time you scrolled through your Twitter feed and you saw people just extending grace and forgiveness to each other? I, it's been a, I don't think I've ever seen that. It's, and sometimes... It's unsettling in our culture when people see real, genuine, gospel-level forgiveness of horrific wrongs. It, it's the people that are outside of Jesus' grace go, whoa, whoa, whoa. How can you do that? How's that possible? You'll see an image here of the Emmanuel American Methodist Episcopal Church of Charleston, South Carolina, a historic black church. On June 17th in 2016, 21-year-old white supremacist Dylan Roof walked into this church 
After sitting in the parking lot for over an hour waiting for a prayer meeting to end around 9 p.m., he calmly entered the church carrying an automatic weapon and he shot and killed nine people. He murdered nine African-American Jesus followers because of racial hatred. Just a few days after that horrific tragedy, the daughter of one of the victims, a woman named Nadine Collier, stood in front of TV cameras and microphones and addressed the man who killed her mother. Here's what she said. This is an excerpt. You could listen to the whole thing on YouTube still. She says, I forgive you. I want everyone to know that. You took away someone very precious from me. I'll never get to talk to her again. I'll never be able to hold her again. But I forgive you. I pray God would have mercy on you. You hurt me more than words can say. You hurt a lot of people. But if God can forgive you, I forgive you. Now, as a pastor, I believe in forgiveness, but I've got to ask the question, what kind of love is that? What kind of grace makes that possible? There's a part of you that goes, whoa. Dylan never, never received that forgiveness as far as anybody knows. He said, I don't regret what I did publicly. I was trying to incite a race war. But she can forgive. How is that possible? Remember the amount that the servant owes 10,000 talents, an impossible sum, and the guy owes him 100 denarii. That's 100 days' wages. Not a small sum, but nothing compared to what he was forgiven, right? That's the principle. If you can't forgive, you're saying, well, I'm really a higher tribunal than God, and what you did to me is worse than what anything I've ever done to God. That's the height of spiritual pride and deadness. I'm not saying that it's easy. It's not easy for me. I'm saying that to be like Jesus in the world means that we have compassion. We cancel the debt because ours has been canceled and we let people go. And what a great picture, what a needed picture in our world today of the gospel. So your spiritual challenge, we've been giving you challenges each, each, uh, each week, right? Here's your spiritual challenge should you choose to accept it. Everybody here has something to forgive. And everyone in here has something you need to be forgiven of. I'm not talking about you and God. That, that's confession. We talked about that last week. You can certainly do that. I'm talking about relationally. Some of you, probably, probably most of you in here, are, are, are holding something against someone, and maybe you've been doing it for years, and you've never forgiven them. You've never let it go. You're still playing that tug of war that I was showing you with Keenan, right? You're still doing that emotional and you're not free. This is the week. Release them. Cancel the debt. Let them go. For your sake and for the sake of the God who's forgiven you an infinite debt. Or, and or, probably both, somebody in here needs to ask forgiveness. You've been too proud and stubborn to acknowledge it. This is the week. Go acknowledge it. And see what your gracious king will do. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you and we praise you that you are, have forgiven us an infinite debt. And the truth is we, we do our calculations wrong, God. We think we owe a little and that everyone owes us a lot, and it is not true. We owe you everything and you paid our debt. Help us to be freely forgiving people as we have been freely forgiven. We thank you, Lord Jesus, our King, our Master, because you have compassion on us, canceled our debt at the cross, and set us free. We pray this in your name. Amen.